Welcome to Habeas Humor the Live! Live television show. Oh shoot, I may, uh, I may have just went way above what my mic level can handle there. <laughs> So, but we are in Habavision, you guys, that's right. We now record not with just a mic, but a video camera. As I speak, this show is live streaming for Patreon subscribers, and tomorrow all the rest of the world will be able to watch on YouTube. If you prefer the classic audio podcast format, don't worry. You can still get that as well. It just won't be nicely edited anymore because this show has gone live. It's exciting, it's dangerous, anything can happen, and I mean anything. My shitty electric wiring might short out. My shitty internet service might go down. Consider yourself on notice. If your screen suddenly goes blank, <laughs> the likely cause is one of the two things I just said, or it's always possible I am being murdered. Just wait and see. If the show comes back on, that means I'm all right. If not, somebody please come feed my cats. Anybody. You know, some pet apps Pants out there might be going, hey, she called it a television show, but it's not a real television show. Oh, yeah? How the fuck do you figure? Is it telly? Yeah. Is it vision? Yeah. Then what more is required for it to be a television show? Hell, you can even watch me right now on your TV if you have a Roku, a Fire Stick, a Game Box, whatever. So why in the year 2019 should we be limiting the definition of TV show to the dinosaurs of the airwaves, cable? Sorry, NBC, CW, Fox, guess just who moved into your market? Guess who just moved in? Oh no, did it get warm in here? That's the competition heating up. So be sure to check the show notes for the links to all of our platforms. YouTube, Patreon, Libsyn, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, Facebook, Twitter, Reddit, under your damn bed. I'm everywhere. Hey, if you're watching on YouTube, please subscribe to this channel by clicking the subscribe button below. I'll let you know, I'll let you in on a filthy secret. YouTubers need to have a certain number of subscribers to unlock all the features of the service. And also, I really would like to have more subscribers than Cookie Swirl C whose videos entirely consist of opening up packages of My Little Ponies. That is literally all. She has 11.8 million subscribers. So do me a favor and help me hold on to the delusion that researching and writing shows is still somewhat worth the trouble. Subscribe to Habeas Humor, otherwise I will have to change this whole show either to unboxing or right-wing propaganda. Those are the two things that make it big on YouTube. Are you subscribed yet? Great! Let's get to some legal news. Given our views on the legal news. Today is June 19th, aka Juneteenth, also known as Juneteenth Independence Day or Freedom Day. This is when the U.S., or at least some of the U.S., celebrates the emancipation of slaves. In reality, as you probably know, emancipation did not happen all in one day, or even all in one year. <laughs> Shut up, music. See, live. Anything can happen. Uh, Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation during the Civil War, legally took effect on January 1st, 1863, but only applied to Confederate states who weren't exactly complying with federal policy at the time, so that was sort of a fail. Plus, there were several areas in the Confederacy, including all of Texas, <laughs> and, as you would assume, that were exempted from the M Pro, so double fail. Fast forward two years to 1865. Civil War has ended. President Lincoln has been assassinated. 13th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, the one that says no slavery, has been passed by both houses of Congress and is working its way through the state ratification process. Despite all this, slavery continues, especially in Texas, where tons and tons of slaveholders and slaves had relocated after making a mass exodus from battleground Confederate states. Then on June 18, 1865, Union Army Major General Gordon Granger arrives in Galveston with 2,000 federal troops to occupy Texas on behalf of the federal government. The next day, June 19th, 1865, Granger makes a public announcement. Like, he yell literally yells it from a, a balcony, Evita style. This was the announcement. Sorry, I'm just gonna... I have to warm up the voice for this. <laughs> the people of Texas are informed that in accordance with a proclamation from the executive of the United States, all slaves are free. This involves an absolute equality of personal rights and rights of property between former masters and slaves, and the connection heretofore existing between them becomes that between employer and hired labor. 
The freedmen are advised to remain quietly at their present homes and work for wages. They are informed that they will not be allowed to collect at military posts and that they will not be supported in idleness either there or elsewhere. End of announcement. Absolute equality of personal rights, you know, more or less. Except we tell you where you'll work, we tell you where you'll live, how loud you can be, where you cannot congregate, and no idleness. Did it occur to anyone in the government that people who just got freed from slavery could use, at the very least, a week off? A short vacation after 200 plus years of slavery before starting their new lives as a brutally oppressed worker class? It did not occur to the government, and there was no vacation. In fact, for the most part, there was still slavery. In 1865, there were about 250,000 slaves in Texas. It was a long time before all of them heard about the June 19th proclamation. There was no Twitter. So not everything was worse. Back then, when executive orders came out, you had to read about it in the news. And I'm guessing that about five people in all of Texas could read at the time. The federal government did not disseminate the proclamation beyond yelling it from the balcony, and they did not go around Texas enforcing the order to end slavery. Most of the slave owners eventually freed their slaves. Oftentimes, they waited until after the autumn harvest. In one case, it was six years later. The white supremacist population took it upon themselves to try and make the black population wish they had never been freed. They discriminated, terrorized people, murdered people. So in that sense, it's just like now. When the anniversary of June 19th came around, freed slaves would celebrate it, and over time it stuck as the primary date to celebrate emancipation. Juneteenth has not been all that well known among the white people, but that has changed in the last few years, largely thanks to television shows like Atlanta and Blackish. It turns out that we get better as a society when different voices are represented in the media. Who knew? <laughs> The first official Juneteenth holiday in the U.S. was established by the state of Texas pursuant to legislation introduced in 1979 by then-freshman state representative Al Edwards. Here's a picture of him, right there. So Representative Edwards served until 2011. So his political career spanned over 30 years. The majority of the United States have followed the trend that Edwards and Texas started, and they have officially enacted their own Juneteenth official state holidays. Just today, the government of Pennsylvania, the state I live in, made it official that every June 19th is to be observed statewide as Juneteenth, National Freedom Day. Big thanks to the state legislators that have been working for years to get that done. Back in 2011, State House members student Susan Helm, Ronald Waters, and several others introduced House Bill 2190, an act providing for the annual designation and holiday observance of the third Saturday in June as Juneteenth National Freedom Day in this Commonwealth. But it never got passed. It was referred to the House Committee on State Government, which never voted on it. And honestly, um, I think it's supposed to be the 19th, not the third Saturday that really doesn't work when you're doing a teenth thing. Susan Helm tried again this year, introducing an identical bill, more or less, into the House in February. House Bill 619, co-sponsored by several other House members, took three months, but this time the House Committee on State Government finally voted on the bill and approved it in May. It then went to the State Senate Committee on State Government, which finally approved it about a week ago. Then a week later, on June 17th, with two days left to shit or get off the pot already, the Pennsylvania State House and State Senate both voted to pass the Juneteenth Act. It went to Governor Tom Wolf yesterday, and he signed it today. Yay! Happy Juneteenth! By the way, the Texas State Representative, Al Edwards, still kicking at 82 years young. He's not watching right now, since I have not received his patron pledge. Maybe he's more the unboxing My Little Pony type. That's all right. I'm <laughs> not judging. Anyways, to Mr. Edwards, Ms. Helm, and everyone else who has helped raise the profile of the Juneteenth holiday, thank you for your hard work. We owe you a debt. And speaking of debt, Loan shock, 
When you owe money, no pay money, telling me that you are so sorry. Are you trying to be funny with loan sharks? Predatory lending, it's as old as civilization. And uh, the classic flavor of predatory lending practice is loan sharking, uh, lending money at a super high interest rate that normally would not be legal, except banks get an exception when they is issue credit cards with annual percentage rates of 20 to 30 percent. They essentially get to operate as legal loan sharks. Why? Money in politics. Look it up. In 2016, American credit card companies made $163 billion in gross income. That's $63.4 billion of interest payments, $26.6 billion of cash advance fees, $12.5 billion of annual fees, $12 billion of late payment fees, $42.4 billion of merchant fees, and $6.3 billion from enhancement income. Those are extra services that can come with your card or are available through it, such as insurance products. To illustrate the amount of special privilege that credit card companies are able to get through their bribes, excuse me, I mean lobbying, let's compare merchant fees in the US and Europe. Merchant fees are also known as interchange fees. So whenever you use your credit card to pay for something, the merchant has to hand over a cut to the credit card company. In the US, it amounts to between 1% and 3%. However, in Europe, Visa and MasterCard interchange fees are capped at just 0.3%. But what about all the consumers that don't pay their credit card bills? Aren't the banks justified in charging so much interest and in fees on account of all the risk they bear? Won't someone think of the banks, the poor banks? Well, it turns out the credit card companies charged off just $28.3 billion in 2016. That's about the same amount that was brought in from the cash advance fees alone. In other words, consumer defaults put only a small dent in the bank's profits. This figure also indicates that the vast majority of credit card holders do pay their bills, some with a ton of cumulative interest over time. So it is rather outrageous, in fact I would call it offensive, that these companies jack up their APRs well into the double digits for any borrower considered the slightest bit risky. After expenses, and huge credit card companies like Chase Bank make yearly profits in the billions. And they write off those defaults, you know. <laughs> Protecting consumers from financial institutions and their unmitigated greed is not something the U.S. does particularly well. Remember the savings and loan scandals of the 1980s, the too-big-to-fail bank collapse crisis from about 10 years ago, which was followed by a wave of illegal mortgage foreclosures and property seizures, a.k.a. the foreclosure gate scandal of 2010. Then more recently, there was the Wells Fargo fake accounts scandal, and you could do more research and find tons more things the banks have done really shady or even illegal. The people who get it the worst are the people at the bottom of the social pyramid, the poor. People who don't bring in much income, so they have to look for low payment options, even if that means obscene interest payments and fees. They often don't have great established credit history or high ratings to give them more choices and more bargaining power with lenders. They tend to be undereducated thanks to our shitty U.S. education system, which has gotten even shittier since Donald Trump and Betsy DeVos took charge of it. Low income also means higher occurrences of falling behind on payments, which means incurring late fee after late fee, making the debt even larger. And being late with payments is something that tends to make your interest rates go even higher. These are mostly the people whose homes went into foreclosure during the financial crisis. And then they fell victim to the foreclosure fraud I mentioned a moment ago, the robo-signers and all that. We were just talking about Juneteenth and the emancipation of black slaves in America. I mentioned how such people became immediately oppressed in other ways. Think about it. You're out there trying to start a life at square one. You have no money no property, and no education, and most of the country hates you because of the color of your skin. You are already up Shit's Creek without a paddle, and you are supposed to somehow make your way in the world. Many people like to point to prominent figures like Frederick Douglass and Booker T. Washington and be all like, see, they pulled themselves up by their bootstraps, so none of you all have any right to complain. But what happened to the majority of freed slaves? They suffered financial oppression, social oppression, and got stuck in a multi-generational cycle of poverty. 
That is what happens to most people in that kind of situation. It doesn't matter who you are, what color you are, or what country you're from. The overwhelming odds are that if you start out poor, you will finish poor. People like Donald Trump, who were born rich and have had silver spoon in their mouth their whole lives, they simply don't understand that. And neither really do regular people who happen to have gone through life playing on a mostly even field. You know, the cishet white male snowflakes like my father. So I was going somewhere with this. Oh yeah. Do, 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 do. Two days ago, Bloomberg ran an editorial by Mark Whitehouse, not to be confused with the White House, which doesn't come out with useful or honest reports on anything. The Bloomberg piece was signal boosted yesterday in a tweet by Eugene Scott. It starts off as follows, the story that is. One question is, or should be, central to any assessment of the state of America. Why, more than a century and a half after slavery ended, does the typical black family remain so much poorer than the typical white family? That's the end of the quote. The article then makes the case that the answer in large part, according to White House and a new study he cites, is that generation after generation, the US system of real estate finance has enriched white people at the expense of black people. I'm shocked, are you shocked? You may have heard of redlining before. That was government policy that made real estate in primarily black neighborhoods ineligible for federally subsidized loans until the late 1960s. That alone cost black families in America somewhere between three and four billion dollars collectively in today's money. Why? Because they got overcharged for housing. They would often enter into these so-called contract for deed arrangements. Since it was so difficult for black people to get loans, other people brought up or bought up the houses. And then they would turn around and do this contract for deed thing, which is basically a rent to own agreement from hell. You, the supposed buyer, will make payments, but you will not hold the title to the property. You'll have to maintain and improve the house yourself, and you'll pay for years and years at a huge interest rate, and then one day you will finally get the deed, maybe. This was widespread during the 1950s and 1960s. Then came the 1970s and the FHA HUD scandal, in which real estate speculators would find near worthless properties, they would bribe FHA appraisers to say they are worth four times as much money as they really are. Then the buyer would take out an FHA insured mortgage on the inflated amount. They would resell the building to an unwitting buyer who will then get their own FHA mortgage for the same inflated amount since that's supposedly what the house is worth. The buyer would even get a huge break on the down payment under a federal program that existed at the time so the shady seller would be all like, hey, this house can be yours for just $200 down. And the seller would downplay the hell out of the fact that the price of the house was actually 100 times that. And the buyer was going to be getting in way over their head and would probably end up getting foreclosed on. But mortgage companies make a killing anyway because the loans were 100% federally insured, so they got all their money back. Plus, they charge these exorbitant origination fees on FHA loans. You'll hear financial companies say a lot that is um, say a lot that it's more costly to lend to poorer people. Therefore, it's okay to charge more. That is often false. So that is the track record of banks and lenders. It is not good, and the predatory practices have not really gone away. They just grow ever more sophisticated. This is um, a credit card, new credit card, just came in the mail. Let's look at this. When we get a new credit card in the mail, if you're like most people, you open up the envelope, you take out the card, you look at all the rest of this shit and decide you'd rather stick a fork in your eye than read it and you throw it in the garbage. Part of what you just threw out there was your borrower agreement. It contains all the rules of using your credit card account. Well, I mean, why go through it with a fine tooth comb? I, it can't say anything too awful, right? The bank has to follow the law, don't they? Yeah, and when banks come up with schemes to screw the public, most of them are careful to work within the parameters of what is technically legal, but they also put a lot of money and effort into getting the law to favor them and disfavor consumers. 
and should some pesky consumer protection measure make it into the books, the banks can come up with super creative workarounds. For example, one of the most ubiquitous sections of any modern consumer contract, be it for a bank account, a credit card, even cell phone, cable service, you name it, is the arbitration agreement. The company will require that if you use their product or service, you must waive the right to sue them in court over any dispute that may arise. If they overcharge you or wrong you in some way, your only recourse is alternative dispute resolution, i.e. binding arbitration. It's not the complete end of the world, but the arbitration system tends to work more favorably for the bank or whatever big merchant you are taking on. For one thing, the arbitration company you go to will have the big, the, the company, the actual arbitrator, like the AAA or whatever forum, they've got that big merchant and their binding arbitration clause to thank for all the business coming in. So if the arbitration company wants to keep that flow of business, they probably should not make judgments that upset the big guys too much. Comcast did this. They put arbitration clauses into their cable contracts. Then they defrauded customers who were powerless to take them to court. In a June 7th story on ArsTechnica.com, John Brodkin reports that Comcast tricked some 50,000 customers in Washington state into paying an extra $5 a month for a supposed protection plan that would give them free repair service if a technician had to come over to fix the cable. But in reality, the majority of problems were not covered under the plan, so it was a scam and it made Comcast about $88 million. The silver lining is that the Washington State Attorney General did take Comcast to court for violating the state consumer protection law. Comcast still tried to get out of the case by arguing that there was an arbitration agreement with the consumers, so the company can't be sued. And the Attorney General was like, we're the government, not the customers, you fucks. And the court said, yeah, you fucks, pay up. So that was cool, and Comcast supposedly has to refund the fraudulent charges, though it is unclear exactly how much. The state attorney general had also asked the court to order Comcast to pay $83 million in fines, but the court awarded just a bit more than one-tenth of that. The customers themselves might have done better if they were allowed to sue directly, because a court is probably more prone to award a large amount of punitive damages to be paid to the sympathetic defrauded customers as opposed to ordering $83 million in fines that would just go somewhere into the state treasury. But the only practical way for consumers to sue is via class action, which may or may not have been specifically barred under Comcast's particular arbitration agreement. Many arbitration contracts have left that ambiguous, but that is changing as the courts in the U.S. move towards being less consumer friendly and the banks and other large corporations grow bolder. Making customers give up their right to bring a class action lawsuit is a huge deal. Let's say your bank charged you an unfair overdraft fee. You could sue them or take them to arbitration, but that's a hell of a lot of time and effort to go through over like $40. Virtually no one is going to do that, but if you can find evidence these improper overdraft charges are a systematic thing, you can bring a class action lawsuit on behalf of yourself and the other million or so customers the bank has screwed over. Now instead of a $40 case, the bank has a shit serious $40 million lawsuit on their hands. They sure don't want that, so what stops them from just writing into their bank account and credit card agreements no class action lawsuits if you want to do business with this bank. Nothing. Nothing stops them from doing that. There was an attempt to make that illegal. In July of 2017, the U.S. Consumer Financial Protection Bureau issued a rule barring banks from putting class action waivers into agreements for bank accounts and credit cards. You may have heard of the CFPB, maybe from past episodes of this show. It was originally conceived of by Elizabeth Warren, who has actively worked to protect consumers in the financial markets. The name of the Bureau reflects that goal, hence the name Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. The CFPB became an official executive agency as part of the Dodd-Frank financial reform legislation. 
The job of the Bureau is to oversee financial institutions and ensure that all consumers have access to markets for consumer financial products and services that are fair, transparent, and competitive. They implement the federal consumer financial laws enacted by Congress, and that often involves making regulations. For example, last month, the Bureau proposed regulations that would support the purpose of the U.S. Fair Debt Collection Practices Act. That is the law that prohibits collection companies from doing stuff like stealing your car or breaking your legs in order to get you to pay your credit card and medical bills. It's good to know that the CFPB is not officially dead yet, though it may be unofficially quite impotent seeing that it is an executive agency within the Trump administration. Then again, Donald Trump is one of the biggest debt reneggers of all time, so it could be he likes the Bureau. It keeps the debt collectors from calling my phone at 3 a.m. when I'm trying to write my Twitters. The proposed regulations would, among other things, limit collection calls to seven per week and prohibit debt collectors from suing customers or threatening to sue for debts that are uncollectible due to the running of the statute of limitations period. Unfortunately, we are a long way from seeing those regulations enacted and the people in charge don't give me a lot of confidence. Since Congress gave the Bureau its power, Congress can also take away the Bureau's power. Plus, as an executive agency, the Bureau is run by Donald Trump and whomever Trump appoints. The first appointee to run the CFPB, or the first long-term appointee anyway, was Mick Mulvaney, a Republican congressman from South Carolina. He was a founder of the House Freedom Caucus, which is a club for all the very worst members of Congress, the ones who want so badly for you to not have health care, particularly if you're a woman, that they have no qualms about shutting down the government however many times they need to in order to get the ACA repealed and get Planned Parenthood defunded. Mulvaney resigned from Congress in 2017 to take the job running the CFPB, which was yet another fox guarding the hen house situation the executive branch. In June of 2018, he fired the entire advisory board of the CFPB. He said some shit about the agency being too important to America to have it reflect the Obama administration or Elizabeth Warren in any way. By the way, Mulvaney was caught cheating on his taxes by paying his nanny under the table for four years. Today, he is the White House Chief of Staff. Back in 2017, when the CFPB issued the rule limiting what the banks could put into their arbitration agreements, the Bureau was not yet being run by Mick Mulvaney. Instead, the director was Richard Cordry, who had run the Bureau ever since its creation during the Obama administration. Once the Trump administration took over, Cordry didn't last long. The Trump transition team may have been slow and clumsy, but eventually someone figured out that there was a federal Bureau protecting consumers of financial services, and that is not acceptable. So Cordry was out. The Republican Congress passed a joint resolution disapproving the Bureau's rule about class actions, and the resolution was signed into effect by Donald Trump on November 1, 2017. If making people forgo their access to the court system as a condition of getting a bank account or a credit card, or in some cases a job, seems to you like some oppressive, unconscionable, anti-consumer bullshit, you wouldn't be the first to think so. The freedom to contract does have some limits. A person who thinks that they are stuck in a truly unconscionable contract can ask a court to invalidate the contract on grounds of unconscionability or um, being against public policy. When it comes to certain arbitration contracts, this has been tried but the results are not promising. The U.S. Supreme Court has heard three big cases on this issue. Circus City Stores v. Adams in 2001, AT&T Mobility v. Concepcion in 2011, and Epic Systems v. Lewis in 2018. See the show notes for links to those decisions. In all three cases, the Supreme Court ruled in favor of the big companies and held that their arbitration agreements are legal and enforceable. Now, none of those cases were about consumer financial agreements specifically. So that is a potential bump in the road for the banks. And there is one other thing they are a little worried about as well. 
Sometimes, at least in theory, state law can invalidate an arbitration agreement, especially in a notoriously consumer-friendly state such as California. There is some legal authority in California that says an arbitration agreement might not be valid if the consumer is forced to accept it with no way to opt out. That worries the banks enough to start looking for ways to cover their ass just in case California law should bite them right in it. Chase has come up with a workaround and it goes like this. Hey Credit Warriors, Credit Shifu here, and if you have a Chase credit card or several Chase credit cards, you will probably have received, or well, you will have received um, emails in the last few days for each account um, telling you about a few changes to the account, okay? So it details, you know, some other changes first, but then it has this clause about something called binding arbitration, okay? Now you might not know what this is, all right? So we're gonna explain it in this video and tell you how to opt out of it and you should probably opt out of it okay so let's first we'll go through what it is first so in the email you'll see this clause a binding arbitration provision is added and the military lending act notice is revised accordingly you can reject the binding arbitration agreement you must mail your rejection to us by 8 9 2019 so august 9th 2019 please see the end of this notice for instructions details on the changes to your account effective 8 10 2019 okay Chase recently sent out an update agreement to its credit card holders, which, you guessed it, takes away the right to sue Chase in court, including in class actions. Now, don't panic because you can opt out of this agreement. And the reason why you can opt out is so that you cannot later say the bank forced you to agree to those terms. You just need to send Chase an opt-out letter, a paper one, with an envelope and a stamp by August 9th, 2019. And if you just can't even with the envelopes and the stamps, like I know is the case with many of you young people out there, well, then that's on you. At least this time, the thing you can't be bothered to drop in the mail isn't a ballot for a monumentally important election, the results of which affect everyone else in the world, people besides your lazy, apathetic behind. Fuck you if you didn't vote for Hillary Clinton. Anyhow. What do you write in your letter opting out? We'll get to that. First, I'm gonna explain why you should opt out. Reason number one, because fuck Chase and their sneaky bullshit. They're trying to get over on you by sending you an email fucking notice that they hope you don't even read. They figure that even if you do read the notice, chances are you'll get bored before you reach the part about opting out. And even if you do read that, you won't send the letter. So send the letter. Send it, if for no other reason than to give them the middle finger and make them have to do the work of processing your mail. Reason number two why you should opt out of the new agreement because you might need to sue Chase someday, who knows? They might make an error on your bill and refuse to correct it, or I don't know, illegally foreclose on your house. There are all sorts of potential scenarios, so don't lock yourself into their unscrupulous arbitration agreement. Guess what, though? It's not just about you. Reason number three why you should send Chase your opt-out letter right now is to put the brakes on Chase getting an epic-sized get-out-of-class actions lawsuits free pass. Remember how I said a few minutes ago that class actions are the big money cases that really mess with the banks? The fear of having to defend a big class action case is part of what keeps banks such as Chase at least somewhat honest. Every person who does not opt out of the new arbitration agreement makes that free pass bigger. Every person who does opt out makes that free pass smaller. So here is how to do the letter. The instructions are also in Credit Shifu's video in the article on thinkprogress.org that is linked in the show notes and in the notice Chase should have sent to you if you are covered under their new rules. You have the right to reject this agreement to arbitrate if you notify us no later than 8-9-2019. You must do so in writing by stating that you reject this agreement to arbitrate and include your name, account number, address, and personal signature. Your notice must be mailed to, you, to us at P.O. Box 15298, Wilmington, Delaware, 19850-5298. Rejection notices sent to any other address or sent by electronic mail or communicated orally 
will not be accepted or effective. So they shouted that from the balcony, kind of, but you don't get to. You have to send it in writing. Don't think of it as a chore to mail this letter. Think of it as like retro fun, like steampunking, you know? You can go all out with the packaging, make it out of metal maybe, I don't know. Check the postal rules first. Speaking of sending things, it's time to celebrate the amazing people who contribute a piece of their hard-earned money to support this show. This show is made possible by the pledges of generous and wonderful people who contribute a dollar a show and in some cases even more. Just like your favorite street vigilante windshield washers, I work for tips. So if you have a dollar or so to toss my way for each one of these shows, visit patreon.com slash habehumor. The link is in the notes of the show accompanying this episode as a patron you will receive special bonus perks. What perks? Well, those of you watching live are getting one right now. Patrons get to watch me do the show L-I-V-E live on your YouTube. They also get the audio and the video of the show Wednesday night while the rest of the world has to wait until Thursday. There are other Patreon prizes as detailed on our Patreon site. One long-standing patron perk is a drink on me if you pledge at the $5 per episode level. Most, if not all of you $5 patrons have not gotten your drinks yet because you refuse to hang out with me. So I am to hold you over until then. I am sending each of you one of these. Ta-da! What is it? Is it a jar? Oh no, my friends, this is not just a jar. This is a jar by Sharon. A jar -own, if you will. On the outside is the Habeas Humor logo. Let's see a close-up. Ooh. On the inside is two fluid ounces of space for you to do whatever you want. I recommend filling it with liquor and bring it in, bringing it on your next plane trip as the size is TSA compliant. It even comes with a lid. I gave these out at the American Atheist Conference that took place in Cincinnati over Easter weekend and they were a huge hit. Not just anyone can get their own jar own, but if you have been pledging $5 per episode to Habeas Humor or if you start doing so, one of these will be yours free. Just send in your shipping address and your jar own will be on its way. As always, I want to thank every person who is or has ever been a patron of Habeas Humor. I want to thank our most recent hobby humorist, Fernando Fur. On the hero humorist tier, the $5 per show level, we have our Hall of Famers, Phil Stark, It's a Me, Keith Davies, and Brust Platypus. Yay! Thank you all. On the Herculean humorous tier, the 10 plus dollar per show level, we have the amazing locusts with pitchforks and glow sticks, Ryan Banovsky and top patron Dane Griffith. Yay! You all are one half God. Lastly, we received an incredibly generous lump sum PayPal donation from the amazing Ross D. I love you, man. Hey audience, do you wanna help the show for free? I hope so because free is great. Please go to Apple Podcasts or iTunes or whatever they are calling it right now where they have the podcast store and please rate Habeas Humor five stars. It takes seconds and you can do it right now. So please do it right now. We received several ratings and reviews since the last show. To those people, thank you so very much. And don't forget to also subscribe to this channel on YouTube. Audience participation played along at home. Last episode's audience participation question will was what drink will we have together at American Atheist Con 2019? So actually nobody who submitted an answer 
came to the conference. But the winning answer comes from John of the Wayward Willis podcast, with whom I did have drinks and food last year at American Con, American Atheist Con 2018. I missed his presence very much in 2019. He says he couldn't make it because he was going on another vacation, but he would drink a dirty monkey and toast me while he was laying on the beach. What is a dirty monkey? It is one of those blended slushy drinks. It is rum, coffee liqueur, banana liqueur, cream, half a banana, and ice. You can also decorate the glass with chocolate syrup for that authentic poopy monkey ass crack effect. Please follow John on Twitter. He is at Wayward Willis. This week's audience participation question is, what would be the best form of arbitration opt-out notice if you could send anything you want to Chase Bank? Singing telegram, stripogram, graham cracker, you tell me. To answer audience participation, share this episode on Twitter or Facebook with your answer written in and hashtag it HHAP. I will choose my favorite response and read it on the next episode. Please share this show liberally and tell all your friends. As always, do not take any legal advice from this show or get any big ideas about an attorney-client relationship being formed here because this is for your entertainment only and I may not know what I'm talking about. The attached notes contain links to the sources used in this episode as well as our Patreon page, Twitter, Reddit, Facebook, iTunes, Stitcher, and Google Play. Our email is also there. Habehumor at gmail.com. I am signing off, but you, you my friends, stay legal.